everyone. Thanks for being here. And this talk will be a bit of a cool breeze, pun intended, after a day of seeing probably lots of command line on the screen. Um, I'm kind of new to this. I just finished my PhD a couple months ago. And uh, I started working with a guy named Chris Matman, who I'm sure some of you in here know, uh, at USC. And I met him when I was mostly doing stuff like this. I was deep in snow pits for several months out of the year. And when I wasn't in snow pits or processing data I collected in snow pits, I was writing code and uh, working with the crew at JPL to kind of start this big project uh, on some remote sensing imagery that has kind of blown up over the last couple years. And that's kind of what this talk is going to be about. It's, it's going to be about me going from really being a physical scientist, which I consider myself, to taking several steps towards the realm of data science. And I think uh, the transition that I've made is pretty common for a lot of physical scientists. We start with asking a basic question about what's happening in our environment. And then all of a sudden, we're sitting on a pile of data. And we have to learn how to uh, disseminate that data. And then it gets really exciting when others want to use that data. Um, so I'm going to start off going through that story, and then I'll get into a little bit of Tika. So again, that's me, if you couldn't tell, without the big coat. Um, and here's what we're going to first go through. So the first part of my talk, I'm going to talk about how, as a physical scientist, we start off with this notion of uh, discovery through theory and experimentation. That leads then to a data set creation to data dissemination, and then hopefully allowing others to ask questions through more of a data-driven science model than that theory and experimentation model. So the case study I'm going to use for this, of course, is my PhD research. I only have a couple more years where I can pull this out, and it's acceptable, so I'm going to do it today. Um, thankfully, Apache Khan is in Denver this year. And I could say just west of here is where I did my PhD research in the Colorado Rocky Mountains. And the phenomena that I studied was when dust from the deserts even a little bit further west of here in Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico, when dust from those areas gets blown by the wind, which is very frequent at this time of year, you might notice some nice gusty winds coming out of the southwest, that dust gets blown deposited onto the snowpack of the Colorado Rockies. That makes the snow darker. And as you can imagine, just like going outside wearing a darker t-shirt on a warm day, that snow then absorbs more energy and it can melt the snow faster. So of course, that begs the question, well, why do I care about that, which all physical scientists have to hear all the time. Um, we should be particularly interested in this here at Apache Con this year because 70% of our water that we're using here in Denver comes from the melted snowpack. So our showering water, the water that's in our beer, the water that's in my tea, 70% of it has come from the snowpack of the Colorado Rocky Mountains. And because all of that comes from snow, it's a heavily managed system. It has to be the snow melt is stored in reservoirs uh, all over the state. And so water managers are really interested if you have something that's going to melt the snow a lot faster and it's going to come when it wasn't expected. So anyway, this is the kind of this is the phenomena that piqued my interest and I wanted to study using satellite remote sensing. So this is what this looks like in a really nasty kind of year, not that pretty. So you go up into the mountains and Rather than the snow being white, which you can see in the upper left-hand corner, it is a dismal brown pink. And that is just sucking up a lot of additional energy. So as a skier, I ski into the back country. I look at that. I said, what a mess. I start asking some questions about it. And then here goes my journey from understanding this as a physical phenomena to managing what I'm calling a data bonanza, how I have taken this journey. So the first step is, say I'm over in Colorado, and I want to know, OK, well, in this particular place on Earth, in Colorado, in the Rockies, 
how much additional energy is being absorbed by snow or being absorbed by this dirty snow at a particular time. And I happen to look over the last about 15 years, from year 2000 to now. Now, if I looked at one particular spot and I got an integer value, say I said, okay, it's absorbing 200 watts per meter squared additional per day over 15 years. If I just put those integers into a vector, I've got about 12 kilobytes of data. Not quite a data scientist yet. I haven't, my big data questions aren't coming up. But thankfully, I'm a remote sensing scientist. And so that allows me to ask this same question, how much energy is being absorbed by snow all over the world? And thankfully, I use a sensor that is a, a global sensor, so I can ask that. So now, at all snow-covered regions in the world, I ask that same question. How much extra energy is being absorbed? Because I want to know when the snow is going to melt. All of a sudden, we bump up our 12 kilobytes over 15 years to about 27 terabytes of data. Even if I just was sitting on that data, if it was on 27 one terabyte drives on my desk, still not really an exercise in how to get, how to get others to become data-driven scientists with these questions. The next step, of course, is evangelism. So over the last six years, I write an algorithm, I create a remote sensing product, and that's me, if you couldn't tell. I added the red hair for effect. Uh, I go to a bunch of presentations and I say, these are our results, look how cool this is, the snow is melting faster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then all these men, which apparently fits the bill as well today, Say, we want your data. Where can I get your data? Are these data available? So all of a sudden, I go from just this person that wrote an algorithm that's sitting on my desk to saying, how am I going to back this up? How am I going to disseminate it? How am I going to let people discover these data? And a lot more complex questions start to come up. And when you're just working in your own community, the questions can still be relatively simple. You can have one-on-one -on -one interactions with people, say, here, give me an FTP, I'll dump a bunch of data. But as you can imagine, in science, I don't want just my small little snow science community asking these questions. I want lots of people asking these questions. So then you start working a lot with a bunch of people that know a lot more about this. Uh, and that's the crew at JPL. So now we get our data and we make a nice little interface and we put that 27 terabytes on the web. We make a fancy little uh, map interface that allows people to select and find, uh, find a location. Those, uh, that little picture up there is a remote sensing image with some of my data draped over it in the uh, Hindu Kush. So that kind of allows a, a gooey sort of way for people to go out and discover these data. Oops. So I've gone from asking the question, creating my data set, making a form of data dissemination, and now I'm at data-driven science, right? Others can just download 27 terabytes and see what the data tell them. Not quite yet. That data discovery tool is really what the next two years of my postdoc with Chris are going to be about. When we ask those questions on a relatively small scale, interpersonally, that I don't really consider data discovery in a big way. My data are here. If they're just in another data repository, if they're just in another repository that your average scientist is going to Google you know, God willing, dust, snow, modus, are they really discoverable if they're just in another place where more scientists have put their data? And I'm going to argue no, and now I'm going to argue that a tool like Tika, if we enable it to find some more data formats that are common, commonly used in polar science, then our data are truly becoming discoverable by the masses rather than housed in these individual data repositories all over the web. So now here we go. Using Apache Tika to explore polar, da polar data, you can't quite see my uh, far side caption, but I think it's something like, hey Edgar, 
where did Joe go, insinuating that our polar bear probably has eaten Joe. Um, so one quick caveat, uh, I'm new to Tika, if you hadn't gotten that. Snow pits do not help you learn Tika, nor help you learn how to program in Java. Generally, in uh, my experience in the physical sciences, we learn the programming language that our advisor learned. And for my case, it was IDL. Uh, Java is a whole different beast, and I'll get into that, and I won't bitch and moan too much about uh, object-oriented programming, though maybe just a little bit. But first, let's talk about polar data. So I say polar data, we probably all think of something different. Some person might think of Antarctica, another the state of Greenland, technically, or the country of Greenland, technically, it's above the northern and uh, southern 66 degrees latitude, so above the Arctic Circle. Um, not all of it is covered in snow and ice. We do get lots of high tundra, but when we start generally talking about polar data, we're talking about not just those areas above 66 degrees, we're talking about the areas that are pseudo-polar, that, uh, that have lots of snow and ice and tundra, so it's kind of a loose definition. So now let's talk about a little bit why is polar science so important? Why do we even care about this? First off, this is sea ice extent over just the last 10 years. Uh, if you keep in your mind's eye the extent earlier in that little loop and then watch it disintegrate, uh, we can see that the polar regions are changing rapidly. Sea ice is just one example, a really great demonstration actually if you're looking for a cool way to say, look how our Earth is changing. Uh, this is used, created with passive microwave data. Um, and so, one, it's changing. So we, we want to get on our analysis relatively quick. Two, it links the globe. It may be above 66 degrees latitude, but as anyone in the East Coast knew this year and got to hear the words polar vortex over and over and over again, I live in Alaska. It's been freakishly warm, so I didn't get to experience that this year. Um, what's happening in terms of Arctic circulation impacts weather on the rest of the globe. It not only impacts uh, atmospheric circulation, it also impacts oceanic circulation. Um, so even though we might think of this as an extraordinarily remote environment, we're impacted daily in, numer in numerous ways by what's happening in the poles. Though we don't think about it, four million people live in this area. While that's about half the population of New York City, um, I'm sure the people that live there would not like us to marginalize them to half the population of New York City. Um, as sea ice changes uh, and those and other temperature changes happen in the poles, the livelihoods of people in those polar regions change. Not only the livelihoods of those people in terms of the resources that they used to have, but the resources that are now coming available. There's a lot going on in terms of what used to be ice covered, and there's a lot of big companies that are extraction based that are really psyched to see what's under the ice. There are shipping lanes that are now opening up that translate to billions of dollars. So it's, it's a hot topic. And then lastly is our sense of discovery. The polar regions, like the oceans, we, we kind of say we only know 2% of what's in the oceans. We know a little bit more about the polar regions, but they remain largely physically and intellectually unexplored. So if you're explorer-minded, both scientifically uh, or athletically, I guess you could say, it's an exciting place to want to go. But back to the cyber infrastructure side of things. So this was from the workshop on cyber in infrastructure for polar sciences held in Minnesota, uh, I believe last year. It says polar scientists need provenance, content, format, and quality information to identify the right data set, evaluate uncertainty, and ensure the replicability of scientific workflows. So this was the first workshop on uh, cyber infrastructure for polar sciences, but a lot of these buzzwords, I think, help make our argument for why uh, Tika would be a good tool to integrate or to integrate into polar science data. So now back to this concept a bit of 
what I said earlier, my data are just in one more repository somewhere on the web. Um, these are just a handful of places that polar or Arctic data are stored. NSIDC, National Snow Ice Data Center, ACADIS, Antarctic Master Directory, Polar Data, British Antarctic Survey, um, and there are lots and lots more. So whether, pardon me, you're, uh, you have a question about a certain place in the poles, uh, it could be about sea ice, it could be about glacier velocities, it could be permafrost, it could be about penguins, and it's at a location on Earth, you're probably going to one of these data repositories, you're using some kind of search interface, and you're going out and you're trying to find as much data as you can to help you answer your scientific questions. Or you're just gonna be data-driven and download as much as you can and let those tell the story. So there are lots of data in a lot of different places, or there are data in a lot of different places, and there's also just lots more data. So this is uh, NCARS data storage, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And if we think about our little timeline of that sea ice, that started back in 2000, so when our sea ice was a little bit bigger, that was less than one petabyte of data, now we're nearing 26. So data in the polls are in a lot of places, and there's also a lot of it. So again, argument for data discovery and enhancing our ability for data discovery. So that brings us to Tika. Who here uses Tika on a monthly basis? Weekly, daily, okay, I figured the faces that I was told to search out, okay. Uh, so for those that don't, it's an automated mind pipe identification and rapid parsing of text and metadata, over 12,000 uh, file types. Right now we're gonna, and I'm, I'm assuming increasing, are we increasing monthly? Monthly, we're increasing often. Often there's lots of people on teams that are uh, adding more file types to be detected. So right now, if we use Tika to do a little Tika magic on the Antarctic Master Directory and say, okay, what file types can we find there? Uh, this is a basic pie chart of what we see. So a good amount of ASCII files, PDF, uh, kind of what you would expect on a website such as this. Uh, in this case, we have about 52% unknown. Um, and while that, was, well, that 52% I can't imagine are all necessarily file types that Tika just can't find, it certainly gives us a little bit of momentum to want to explore what those unknown file types are and try to get them integrated into Tika, because I can assume if they're unknown in the Antarctic Master Directory, they'd be unknown in a lot of other, those da other databases where our polar data are stored. So that's the goal. We want to add file formats commonly used in polar data to Tika. NetCDF, for example, is uh, a file type used in a lot of atmospheric research. Um, right now, it is partially in Tika. You can extract metadata from NetCDF files. Uh, so that would be an example of something to extend to text extraction. Same thing with HDF. And then there are lots of other file types that are begging addition. So what would that entail? And this is going to be, this part here is something that, uh, what's the, what's the word everyone uses as a new, newbie? Newbie? Noob? Chris Mappen always says, yeah, just be noob. It's okay. You can admit that. Um, getting down this flow. So I say, okay, I want to add text extraction for NetCDF files. Or say it's a file type that's unknown. First it has to, Tika has to detect that file type. So I'm pretending like I have a laser pointer this whole talk. Um, so that is augmenting Tika's, Tika's MIME detection facilities to handle new scientific formats. So that's adding uh, the magic, well, adding magic, adding glob patterns, what have you, to simply identify those files. And then there are new parsers and expanding existing parsers. So for example, NetCDF, we're already extracting text, so we'd like to expand the parsing abilities for NetCDF file to extract text and not simply metadata. 
So what that would look like, so here's our NetCDF file. NetCDF files have three parts, variables, dimensions, and attributes. Um, currently, Tika grabs the attributes from a NetCDF file. And that annotates variables or files with small notes or supplementary metadata. So if I were to go to the command line, I said I wouldn't do a lot of command lines. This is the only command line you'll see. Uh, and I input my net CDF file. I use my Tika app. And what I get from that is some basic metadata about the file. Um, we see under content type that it's a net CDF file. Uh, we see a reference for the data, a little bit of a data description. Um, and that's what we get. That's kind of a typical, I would say, metadata output from what I have seen from the net CDF files that I've downloaded. If we go to the next line and I say, OK, rather than metadata, I want to output text, I don't get anything back. And so that's what, uh, that's what we're hoping to fill in, or I'm hoping to fill in over the next couple of weeks. So what would be in that? This would be that other information. And this isn't in the format that Tika would output it, but uh, this is the dimension and variable information that Tika currently is not outputting. So we see the dimensions, that's a latitude and a longitude. Um, we can see under units, degrees north and degrees east, so that's kind of a bounding of where those data are. And all of a sudden, as you're looking through those variables, if Tika is able to discover a latitude and longitude, immediately that enables the data scientists to refine their search and ask additional questions. I want to find data, but I also want to find data at this location. Um, so that's kind of the, what I think is a spatial person, the exciting part, that we're not just looking for data, but it allows us to refine the data that we're looking for. So again, a little bit of how do we do this. Add net CDF text parsing, step one. Step one, rethought. Improve Java skills. Step two, realize I've got to get on the object-oriented train and off the procedural train. I'm working hard on that. Start three, writing code and see what Tika can do. It's been really fun exploring Tika. I mean, it's been, I think, as a first Apache project to work on, I've been totally psyched as a kind of something that you could wrap your mind around. Um, so if you haven't explored it or you know, made your little test.doc and see if you could extract text from it, I'd highly recommend. So here we have all of our data repositories. If we can integrate more scientific data types into Tika, ultimately it will allow more data discovery. And that's really the driving, or at least my uh, driving force behind the next couple years in my postdoc um, are to allow the community that I've previously been with, the polar scientists, to ask more questions and understand these regions in a bigger and better way. And I think Tika is a great tool in that discovery. However, I'd like to leave with a closing thought. In terms of scientific data, and this is hopefully a discussion that we can have in the community, I asked Chris Matman the other day, I was sitting in his office in LA not three days ago, I said, when we're adding scientific data formats and we want to export those variables and dimensions as text, is that text, should that be text or should that be metadata? And maybe you guys have more of a rubric on what you consider metadata about a file. If you're talking about a scientific data file that has a certain dimensions, has a list of variables, has a location, how do you, how do you know or is that totally subjective on what we determine as metadata or as text? And I would love to talk to people more about that. So I know I've got lots of time, but I'm going to close out and hopefully leave a little bit of time for some input from everyone here. So thanks to Polar Cyber Infrastructure, Chris, the uh, Apache Travel Committee for helping me get here. And then if you'd like to get a hold of me, and this is, this is in Greenland, that's about negative 40 degrees. I think that was coming back from going to the bathroom, actually, so you get to 
understand the fun conditions that polar scientists get to work in sometimes. So thank you. I'd love to take any questions or comments or feedback from any of you. As you saw that there was a northing and an easting and a lat long, so it wasn't. That's like the dream goal, right, yeah, that you'd yeah, be, I mean, that you'd be able to do. But if you have a location, you could at least have a query within a certain distance. But, but I mean, that's a little messier, but yeah. Um, does that do the, well, I guess, does it have the extraction? Capabilities of Tika. I guess that's what I missed. If it has the, if it's a, a metadata format, it's a searchable metadata format. But is it? Does it do the extraction of the metadata from file types? Yeah, we use the, 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 I believe the parser library that Tika uses for NetCDF is from yes. UCAR. And so it's using all those open source, all those, you're saying, all those different open source projects to understand file types. From my understanding, Tika's bringing them together. There is, I think there is two projects from those guys that are on SRF, NCI also. Mm -hmm. And that CDF is just one example. That's kind of one that I've pulled out, but as in that 50% unknown block. So it's it's certainly not uh, it's certainly not the only file type that. Yeah. Less, uh, it was like four, three percent. So net CDF is three percent. Possibly, I think I was using it in more of a, an example context of uh, kind of a, how would you say? Uh, the fact of the life is that there's a huge variety of open file formats, mm -hmm. and there isn't very good tooling on kind of any single tooling that would understand them all. Yeah, I think that's what it comes, yeah. it's the, it's the, Understanding them all, context. So I, I think you. I mean, you bring up a great. I mean, I. I don't mean to say that there aren't fantastic open source tools. I mean, Teak was developed. I assume after a need arose from there, are a lot of tools to understand and extract text and metadata from different file types. So. Well, I think. I mean, I. I think those are great points, and I certainly don't know enough about the how Tika or the larger extent of the geospatial side of of the project or how that would be implemented. So I don't think I could speak intelligently about next steps in terms of that, but I think it certainly brings up a good talking point on moving forward with these data and 
certainly understanding if there's a common metadata format and use that's, uh, that should be looked at or understood by people like me pursuing this in terms of a not inventing, reinventing the wheel sort of situation. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Mm -hmm. After the session, after the Wednesday TICA session? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Any other questions or comments? All right, thank you. You and Chris have never actually met in person. We haven't. It was, so, was so going to happen bummer. this year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> said when JPL got yeah. the hack, yeah. I said, what do you mean you've never met? Yeah. I guess you can write books <laughs> these days without ever having yeah. met your co-author. Right. So, okay, yeah, well, <laughs> that happens. That what happens a bummer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, like, hide Chris Carr and give him $50 of petrol. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he was going to use his USC title to come, yeah. and he said, yeah. I could do that, but it would yeah. kind of set a bad, because, yeah. you know, there's plenty of other people at yeah. JPL that wanted to come, so yeah. I guess I can oh, well. turn this off. All right. Well, you